In this section, we will discuss the implications of what we believe. Bobby and Renee discuss the implications of the differing views on gender roles. Bobby describes the slippery slope of cultural and biblical progressivism. They show the dire consequences of the average person believing they can't understand the Bible for themselves. Because we're at a point now where we want to talk about the implications of uh, the viewpoint and the posture we take. And this is far more important than the average person realizes. It's like mm -hmm. what Renee says. I'll have people tell me, well, you have some people who are egalitarian, some are complementarian. You have people on both sides of the issue. What does it really matter? Mm -hmm. It matters a lot. It matters a lot for the faithfulness of the local church and where it's going to end up. And it matters a lot for our faithfulness to God and the best interests of men and women in the church. Let's explain and dive into that. So Renee, if you can, I'd mm -hmm. like you to uh, talk through the different options here for the future. And I'm having trouble with my clicker again. Um, if somebody could move that slide ahead, please. There we go. So if you could talk through these options. With yeah, us. so the path of maintaining um, tradition... So that would be the a real restrictive, hard complementarians typically will want to follow this. Um, the path of like, you know what, it's just safer to do things the way we've always done it. They typically kind of follow a 1950s version of how men and women interact with one another. And um, so that would that one of the particular denominations that's doing that is the Churches of Christ. I was looking for my statistics here. I don't have them uh, in front of me. I can't find them right this second. But... People who have run the numbers say something like by 2050, they'll be um, a third the size that they were at their peak in 1985. So they're shrinking. And they're shrinking because it just doesn't resonate with the average man and woman Nor who's coming in. Nor does it resonate with Scripture, and it, as yeah, we've and, seen. Yeah, it's way more restrictive. than the Scripture allows for so much more freedom, and um, it's bad for men and it's bad for women. Um, the path of following the wider culture, well, if you look at mainline denominations, you have the numbers kind yeah, of maybe off yeah. the top we're, of your head on this. We're going to get to that, yeah. They, the numbers are not good. So when the, the more you start to look like the world around you, the logical consequence of that decision is people figure out they actually don't have to come to church. Yeah. I mean, it's just true. The, the more and more you look like the world around you, well, you can just be a nice person and sleep in on Sunday morning. I have friends who've gone this very path. In an attempt to be more and more inclusive, they've included themselves out of any church fellowship altogether. And, and the denomination, mainline denominations that are doing that, that's their path. So the seven mainline denominations in the USA, these are churches like uh, the United Methodist, uh, the Presbyterian Church USA, the United Churches of Christ, the Disciples of Christ. I've missed a few, but they're called mainline denominations. They are all dying. They've all caved on egalitarianism, on LGBTQ issues, and they're all dying. It's a statistical fact. We'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, but a lot of evangelical churches are following their path now. Um, and so we're going to end up talking about the path of, of pursuing mm -hmm. Scripture. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, Renee, you talked about this a little bit with tradition mm -hmm. and how that's probably not the best way to go. Um, anything else you want to add about that? Because like I have friends in uh, Baptist churches mm -hmm. or in Nazarene churches, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and the, the truth is they're, they're stuck in tradition more than Scripture. Yeah, it's just really bad. It, it, you kind of these churches kind of fall into stereotypes. So you know, like when we say stereotype versus archetype, like a stereotype in literature is like the vamp or the vixen or the virgin. You know, you're it's a real simplified version of what a woman is, right? And and then instead of an archetype being um, this beautiful standard to which we all can aspire with our own personalities and giftings and whatnot. And so these churches really do fall into these stereotypical gender roles, and um, they just don't have a high view of women. Most of those churches don't ask me to come speak for obvious reasons. <laughs> I haven't talked to any of those elderships. So let me talk to you about <laughs> following the wider culture. So um, the reason that I chose that we would go ahead and talk about this as a church, even though it's not part of David Young's book, is because I realized that 
Uh, there is so much pressure to cave on the gender issues today, and it's being driven in our culture by this thing called intersectional feminism. And most of us would go, intersectional, what? Like, what's that? And it's basically a form of cultural Marxism that emphasizes the priority of women. And it's a dominant view in our culture today. So, for example, when you're watching movies, the, it used to be that, that the hero was a man who would rescue the day and all of that. Well, now it's switched. If you'll notice, it's typically a woman. And the pressure's put that women are, are so much better than men. And, and the dominant language is woman, woman, woman. And uh, if you don't believe that, you believe in the patriarchy, you're a misogynist, and all those things. And I realized if we don't talk about these things, the world's totally going to out-disciple everybody in our midst. So what happens today under that kind of influence is that uh, churches are caving and they're re-explaining these passages. Now, I mentioned this just a little bit. I'll go ahead and mention it now. Typically, the trajectory, uh, when you become progressive, there's a mindset. Now, I just want everybody to understand the mindset. I've lived this mindset as a Canadian. A higher percentage of Canadians used to attend church. Some of you have heard me say that before. And, and uh, so the Canadian churches went progressive early, and it decimated Christianity. You see the same thing in Europe. Many of you will have an opportunity to go on a, a European river cruise or something, and they'll stop at the towns, and they'll show you all the church buildings that nobody attends anymore because Christianity has been decimated in Europe and in England and in all these places. And if you go back and trace it out, let me tell you where it started. It started with progressivism everywhere. And here's the mindset of a progressive. The mindset of a progressive is the culture says X. And uh, when I was growing up, uh, long before intersectional feminism and all that, the reason why everybody in Canada abandoned Christianity is because uh, they kept saying that science is so important and science disproves the Bible. So the churches started off trying to say, well, there's parts of the Bible that aren't scientifically reliable, so we're just going to compromise those parts of, of Scripture so that we can claim to be scientists and we can claim to be well-informed. And it just started a trajectory with people. And then what happened is uh, the people ended up realizing well, if, if you're telling me that all the hard teachings of the Bible don't really mean what they say, then I really don't need the Bible, which is another version of what Renee is saying. Here's an expression that we use all the time. Progressives think they're building an on-ramp to the faith for a secular world, but what they're actually doing is building an exit ramp from the faith in front of a non-believing world. So what happens in progressivism is that the culture is very high in its demands that we change the teachings of Scripture to fit with culture. And what a progressive does is they uh, are, over a period of time, they explain away the hard teachings of the Bible to fit with the culture. And so, for example, on gender, it's happening everywhere right now. And... Uh, I have been a part of the Exponential Conference, uh, and I was noticing on Facebook and Twitter a bunch of the people that 10 years ago were strong egalitarians, now on their Facebook posts and on Twitter, they're all LGBTQ affirming. Because what happens is, once you start explaining away the hard passages, say, on gender, you're going to do the same thing on LGBTQ issues, you're going to do the same thing on hell, because you've developed a posture, you think it's enlightened, you think you're helping people, but it's actually the posture of a compromiser. And what happens over time, and I can tell you, I've, 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 I've studied at the highest levels with the best people in the world, and you can see it happening. They're trying to figure out how to make the Bible not say what it says, so that it's more acceptable to enlightened, wise, well-educated people. And the reality is, it's just a sophisticated way of explaining away what God says to do what the world says. And we just, we just can't do it. Um, uh, Renee, do you want to talk us through this part? This is, we're going to get real <clears throat> practical to what is, for many of you, going to be the most yeah. practical part 
of what we're going to talk about. Yes, so the question is, can I understand the Bible if I'm not a scholar? Yes, you can, because I do, and I'm not a scholar either. Um, Scripture tells us that when we receive the Spirit of God, um, we will not have to teach our neighbor. The Spirit of God will help us understand what we're doing. Now, I love a good aid. I think that the aids that are available to us, I love interviewing the scholars that I got to interview. I appreciate their work. But the vast majority of what we find in Scripture can just be read and understood and obeyed. Yes. Um, so, you know, God wouldn't tell his people, uh, Israel, to do this with their children if he didn't think they could do this themselves. They didn't even own a Bible. Think about that. He said, these commands I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. It's critical, critical to feed on Scripture. you got to learn to feed yourself, and then you feed your children. Now, uh, from Acts 17, the Berean Jews were of a more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And then the next one, 2 Corinthians 1, 13 and 14. For we do not write you anything you cannot read or understand. And I hope that as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us just as we will boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. So uh, we're going to talk about the, um, what happens, but let me just describe something. Uh, I'm, I'm going to describe it so that when you experience it, you'll know that we told you about this. Uh, when progressives get a big influence in a local church, what happens is they get so sophisticated at explaining these teachings away mm-hmm. that the average person, here's what they say. Well, by the way, I, I want to remind everybody, there's four key words that they explain the meaning away from the historic way it was understood, like head or like authority, They say it doesn't mean what you think it does. And then there's about 120 verses that I've took the time to go through that they explain away. Uh, And so after they've done that, what happens to the average person, the average good-hearted person, who's especially sitting at the feet of a progressive that they trust and love, they will say, I guess I just can't understand the Bible for myself. And when that happens, the consequences are not good. Renee? Yeah, it makes me um, crazy angry to to watch this in action. Um, To see a scholar with um, nine pages of 10-point font, I kid you not, front and back, explain away 1 Timothy 2 to the audience, droning on and on, reading from this outline. And then at the end of it, people go, well, you know... I guess it's probably just too hard to understand. And and whatever you believe is good, and whatever he believes is good, and we can all just agree to disagree. I mean, we're really close, right? We're really close. You just say that women can't be senior pastors and elders, and we just say they can. That's super close, right? And again, I'm telling you, the way that plays out is not the way they're thinking that it's going to play out. Because when you start to explain away passages on gender, you better believe people under 40 are going straight for the sex passages next. Because who, who wants to have to obey the scriptural sex ethic if they don't have to? So you think, yeah, you think you're building an on-ramp, you think you're being kind and inclusive, and what you're doing is you're telling people that they don't have to read the Bible and then do what it says. You're you're taking away all the power that obedience brings in your life, and it makes me so angry to see people convinced, elders in churches convinced, that they can't read the Bible and lead the people in their care. So... uh One of the things that happens once you do this, we've talked here on the slide, you can see, uh, number one, you can't really understand the Bible because only scholars can probably understand it. So you don't read it, you don't have convictions on it, 
and you tend to rely on liturgy instead of Scripture. So these churches that go this way tend to get more and more liturgical. What I mean by that is the, uh, the leaders start wearing robes. They start making communion something more than just a, a, a remembrance of Jesus. They start making it so sacred and important. And the way the church service goes becomes everything. Because when your theology is not the basis of your security something's got to be the basis of your security. And when it's not your knowledge of and obedience to God's word, it becomes the liturgy, becomes the foundation uh, of it. And so you will find some of the most strict liturgical churches are the most radically progressive and dismissive of biblical teaching. And it's actually the opposite of what God's using today. One of the privileges that I have is to uh, spend a lot of time with international disciple-making movements. And here's how international disciple-making movements work. The average person gets Scripture, or they hear Scripture read to them, and Scripture transforms their hearts, and they obey it, and they follow it, and they want everybody to know what Scripture says, because Scripture is life for them. 1% of the world's population in the last 30 years have been converted in a disciple-making movement. 81 million people, and it's because of the power of Scripture. There is nothing like Scripture. Uh, This has also been documented in North America. The number one predictor of your spiritual growth, do you know what it is? Of every study that's been done, and a gazillion with lots of people have been done, the biggest predictor of your spiritual growth is your engagement in Scripture before God, Mm -hmm. individually. So we want to be people who uphold the importance of knowing and obeying Scripture. Mm -hmm. All right? So uh, I want to talk about the path that God has given to us. So let me read this, Renee, and then you can talk about it. Here's what God said. All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for what? For It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here's what the Apostle Paul told Timothy. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. We, brothers and sisters, do not want to do that. Renee, you have the last comment, and then we'll field some uh, concluding questions. I guess I'll just end with this. When you get to something in Scripture that rubs you the wrong way or that you don't understand or that you don't really like how it sounds, let it beat you up a little bit. And um, don't ask what's wrong with the Bible, what's wrong with that teaching. Ask instead, what's wrong with me that I don't want to do that I, what I think this book is telling me to do? What's wrong with me that I don't want to obey what I'm reading? And ask God to show you. And ask God to show you maybe a better understanding, maybe how to obey the clear teaching that's in there. But it's for our benefit. It's, this, <laughs> this is unlike any other book on planet Earth. This book is living and active, and it has the power through the Holy Spirit to transform lives. It's beautiful. Don't, don't let it sit on your shelf. Don't explain it away. Like walking with God, it's the most exciting. It's the most thrilling thing we can possibly do. And it's hard too, but that's also part of the beauty. I just want to say that it works too. You know, these teachings that we've been talking about, I had a, a big debate with a friend of mine uh, who uh, lives in Australia, so it was kind of a long-distance debate. I was working on all this stuff for Sunday, and we ended up having this big debate about this stuff. And uh, <clears throat> he was trying to tell me how women are just abused by by all this stuff. And I go, well, I'm sorry. Number one, I don't believe that. But number two, I got to just tell you, when my dad became a disciple of Jesus, 
It radically changed the way he was treating my mother. My dad went from a guy who they were separated multiple times. Our whole family was about to collapse. He started following Jesus. He laid his life down for my mother in ways that amazed my sisters. I talked to my dad yesterday. For the last 15 years, every day, he says, my main job is to take care of your mother because of dementia and things like that. And I'm like, that's what a Christ-like servant leader does. <laughs> 